You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. So, my question for you now, then, is um, can Tecmo Super Bowl actually account for changes in ball pressure? <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, it's Super Bowl weekend, so Eric Brody and Karsten Davis stop by to talk about sports games of all kinds, from simulations to the arcade. Plus, Eric and Karsten share updates on their studio's current projects. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 21. It is the weekend of Super Bowl 49, and uh, as a result, we are going to be talking about... Um, Sports games and uh, kind of like sports and gaming, how they relate to each other. Uh, maybe esports. Um, no, I'm kidding because Jim doesn't <laughs> believe that esports are a sport. Um, but we have a couple of guests with us here today. They're, We've got they're um, esports. They are they are esports, but they're not sports. <laughs> sports. <laughs> what was it? You or is it Richard right. that said esports aren't really sports? I forget. Oh, it's me. Is he that okay? Me. That was me. Shots fired. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, we have a couple of guests with us here today. We've got um, Eric Brody of Play Night Games, and we've got Karsten Davis of uh, Last Minute Games, um, who uh, we want to catch up with these guys, but also they both happen to be sports fans. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the few people, or a couple of the few people I know that uh, are both gamers and sports fans. Um, so, yeah. Which I think is kind of crazy. Like, I mean, because I, I, I've truly believe that part of the reason I love sports as much as I do is because I love games. Yeah. And I mean, really, a, a sport is just a game that is played with people instead of, of course, like with avatars or like um, digitally or like on analog, like with a, with a board game. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's still the rules. And I think that's part of the reason I like it is because I watch sports from a perspective of like when I watch football, I like to try to recognize the formations and mm-hmm. I try to recognize like what is supposed to happen in a particular situation in the chess game that is mm-hmm. going on between the offense and the defense. And mm-hmm. um, and I recognize like a lot of people who watch football don't do that. Yeah. But like, I mean, I, I, I'm always surprised when I meet like especially somebody who's like a true game designer mm-hmm. and they're not into sports. So yeah. I think mm-hmm. that they should be, mm-hmm. uh, or at least like be able to appreciate kind of like the mechanics of the game. exactly, yeah. Because yeah. uh, there's a lot of rules. Because sports, and... sports are, are basic. I mean, they're games too. It's just mm-hmm. a different sort of game. So it's sure. it's that they have the rules. They have to, especially something like um, American football does have that sort of strategic back and forth. Um, almost lends itself to a turn based turn based strategy uh, game, very similar to a turn based strategy game. Uh, the way that it kind of plays out with yeah. that kind of back and forth element to it. All the uh, the starts and stoppings between downs, planning out your your next play in advance, and then executing and seeing how it goes. Uh, yeah, there is um, there's an article on Kotaku that um, I can't remember who does all of their sports writing. Um, somebody they stole from Deadspin? No, somebody that they <laughs> stole from. Um, he used to work. I don't think they worked for Sports Illustrated, um, but it was a major outlet. Mm. Um, but either way, uh, he. Uh, it's not Luke Plunkett. It doesn't matter. Um, he did a uh, he did an article on uh, looking at football as a uh, as an RPG, um, which was interesting. This was years ago, um, but there was another one that actually was written during um, the uh, during the World Cup last year. That it was a guest editorial by a game developer, um, where he did a quote unquote review of <laughs> soccer. Mm-hmm. And it was actually fascinating. Like, he reviewed the game as if it was, like, <laughs> a new release. But it's a game that has been out for thousands yeah. of years. And it was, right. it was a really, really well-written article that I suggest anybody to go read. I, I, I think I might have seen that, but I never read it. I should definitely go back to it. Oh, that. it's really – it's, like, 3,000 words long. It, it's what, awesome. what I imagine might probably happen there at some point, too, is talking about, like, the ongoing ongoing uh, balancing issues mm-hmm. and yeah. how the developers are trying to – because they do change the rules mm-hmm. over time in sports. And, and the so. metagame changes. Yeah, the metagame yeah. <laughs> Cool, cool. I wonder what patch soccer is on by now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Probably a very big number. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's there's also that that aspect in um, in sports that the same sort of thing that happens uh, that we see a lot with MMOs when they're patching MMOs or fighting games, where you know one team will have a strategy that will become um, like so dominant that sometimes it will pull 
the, the people that are running the, you know, the organization feel it pulls away from the um, entertainment value. So they'll go in and they'll tweak the rules to try to make it, um, I, don't want, I don't, don't know if I want to say fair, but to make it more um, of a balanced game. Yeah. You, know, mm-hmm. you don't want to have that one strategy that every single person can do that will work every time. You want to have um, more of a back and forth so it becomes more of a contest. Right, even the playing field as much as possible. Um, but yeah, kind of going back for a second to, uh, you know, talking about, like, you know, gamers that aren't sports fans and how mm-hmm. that seems a little bit odd. I find it funny, too, how, um, like, not just gamers, but just kind of, like, the internet in general, um, a lot of them tend to make fun of people that are sports fans. <clears throat> and so, like, you know, they every time, like, you know, the playoffs are happening and people are posting up on Facebook about, like, you know, what's happening with the games, it was like, oh, it must be playoffs time again. And, like, you know, then the thing is that everyone shares, like, the same two web comics about sports ball. Mm-hmm. You know, they're kind of making fun. It's like, yeah, go sports ball team. And, like, you know, trying to make fun of the culture. It's like, you guys do realize that you're nerds, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like, what you do is, like, made fun of by way more people than sports is. So it's like, right. mm-hmm. in a way, it's kind of like, you know, reversing the role. It's like, for me, it's like I just appreciate both, and I think it's stupid to make fun of either. You yeah, know? It's, right. so. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. No, people actually, are passionate. And, uh, people are passionate <laughs> about a lot of different things, and there's there's no problem with any of that. Yep, very true. Yeah, it's funny. I uh, it, it is a little bit of like kind of try, trying to nerd shame somebody. Yeah. Um, like I mean, I have mm-hmm. uh, you know I have a group of friends that. Um, uh, you know, college friends that like going way back. We have a tradition of every Friday, no matter what. Um, we make sure that we get together and we just hang out. And typically that just devolves into just simply a night of playing magic for six hours. <laughs> and um, so we'll be in the middle of like a you know three-hour-long game of like EDH or um, multiplayer game of magic or something like that. And um, my uh, Sports Center app will go off on my phone. <laughs> and it has become this tradition now that whenever that happens, everybody else in the room, the moment that it happens all at the same time to the same rhythm, just goes, Sports. <laughs> and it's like, it's, and like it almost kind of offends me a little bit because it's it's totally shaming me. Well, it's, it's also that, like, you guys are playing magic all night, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's uh, awesome. It's funny that you actually say that. Uh, me and a few of my friends, I actually have a friend who's a sportscaster, and his best friend is a, the complete opposite. He's a giant wow nerd. So whenever we're getting together, me and him are talking shop. All we hear in the background is sports, 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 sports. sports, sports. Sports, 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 sports. <laughs> no, no, stop. You're the odd man out here. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Um, but before we get into the uh, the main topic of discussion for today, we wanted to catch up with these guys a little bit. Um, Karsten was on with us for our uh, Thanksgiving special. Um, but both of these guys have been kind of doing their own projects, and uh, we wanted to sort of get an uh, update on those. So, Eric, have you tell us a little bit about um, what uh, Poly Night's up to? Yeah, sure. So since last time, since we were on, um, I believe that when we actually talked Poly Night, that was at the very beginning of the Kickstarter mm-hmm. campaign. Um, since then, we have uh, we did successfully reach our goal, um, and so uh, we we did uh, we did go through the Kickstarter campaign and came out on the other end successfully, and that was pretty awesome. Um, and then uh, since then, we have. Uh, we got a pretty good amount of press after that, um, as, as happens with successful campaigns. Um, we were actually featured on Eurogamer for 2015 as one of the most anticipa- anticipated titles for 2015, which was pretty damn exciting uh, to be. Because <laughs> you're up here with some pretty big names. Yeah, I mean, with, with people like uh, like Bloodborne and, um, and uh, the new Batman game and stuff like that. And uh, one of the things that we do like to laugh and smile about is uh, we're one of the only two that actually had a picture or a video. It's like it was, it was Batman, Inner Space, and nobody else. Wow. And that was awesome. Um, and, and the reason why is uh, it's, it's kind of one of those games that's very difficult to explain. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's kind of what they said is it's, it's a hard game to explain. They wrote a paragraph and they said at the end, if this makes no sense to you, just watch the video and mm-hmm. it'll make sense. And, uh, and so that was really cool. Um, and then because of that, we, uh, we got notified like the next day after the article was made that uh, we uh, were greenlit on Steam. So mm-hmm. we are officially going to be on Steam, which is really exciting in its own right. I expected that to take half a year this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to kind of change all of my marketing plans for this year of <laughs> mm-hmm. what we're going to do. But that's a good problem to have. Um, as far as on the development side, what we've mostly been working on is uh, we've kind of been what I like to call pre-pro round two. Mm-hmm. Um, so now that we know how much funding we have, we know that the Kickstarter was successful and that there were people who actually would be interested. That's kind of how we were looking at Kickstarter in a lot of ways is whether or not like to kind of gauge audience interest in general. Sure. Um, 
now that we do know that it's something that people would want to be, to see, we know like the team that we'll be working with, we're able to kind of at least uh, guesstimate the scope that we'd want to actually, that we could actually feasibly make within like the next year or so. Um, and so we've been doing a, uh, we've kind of gone back to the drawing board, kind of look, re-looking at designs. Um, we've actually uh, got our level designers actually starting to white box um, and come up with some really neat scenarios. Uh, we've been re-importing everything into a, a new version of Unity now that we're working with Unity 5. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of a lot of t technical stuff, not a whole lot to show yet, but sure, sure. within the next month, um, we're already starting to work on assets and we'll start getting it done. Hopefully have one of the first bubbles done over the next few months to actually like start showing demos and stuff like that That'd be awesome. towards the summer, which will be really cool. Very nice. Cool. So, like, what are the odds that you guys end up, like, sneaking into E3 or something like that? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, we've actually been talking about that. Um, there's, uh, there's, some, there's a few opportunities that are kind of popping up right now that mm -hmm. I'm kind of trying to work out with some people um, of us possibly going to a few conventions in the next few months. Mm -hmm. um, possibly maybe something at GDC that's coming up really quickly. So we really have to figure out that, that funding and that budget really, really quickly. Right. Um, E3 is actually one of the kind of cool moments, like that aha moment that you, that you sometimes have, mm -hmm. um, is, uh, E3 is actually free for people in industry, which is oh, something wow. I never knew. Huh. Um, of course, getting a booth is ridiculously expensive, and mm -hmm. um, and it's really kind of it, it's always felt like E3 is kind of more for AAA developers, and sure. so like there, it wouldn't make sense for us to spend like, to spend like two thousand dollars for a booth at E3, especially right, right. At, at our point of development at the time. Um, but that is a place that we'd like to go. Mm -hmm. We have been looking at like South by Southwest to kind of attend, um, but it would probably be stuff more towards the end of the year or like around release time next year that we'd really kind of be showing up to conventions like that. Gotcha. And you guys are looking at kind of uh, Q1 of 2016? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So were y'all thinking uh, about SGC this summer since it's local and booths aren't ridiculous? Uh, that's in July, right? Right. Yeah. Um, that's actually one I always forget about, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I know that we were talking about maybe trying to do something at Akon because uh, that's just something that we've all done before. And mm -hmm. um, one of our artists, Nick, his uh, girlfriend, and actually Tyler, our creative director, his sister as well, um, she's a, a professional cosplayer. Right. And so they uh, they go to all the major like anime conventions and stuff like that. And so we have been talking about Akon. We have been talking about A-Fest as well. Um, Screw Talk, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good idea and one that I completely forgot about. So, yeah. yeah. Um, we were hoping for maybe like PAX, but it sells out like that, like yeah. PAX Prime. And it's it's already sold out and there are no booths available there. But I, I, Yeah, I feel your pain. Um, <clears throat> just coming back from PAX South, we completely lucked into a booth. Uh -huh. It just so happened that one of my teammates had a uh, another studio she is sort of freelancing for. Uh, they had a booth at PAX South, so we worked out a deal where we split the booth. And it just so happened, and I'll go into a little bit deeper, that we ended up to be on the single best corner in the show. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes serendipity is amazing. Yeah, connect connections like that are always fun. We uh, um really good friend of a lot of ours, but especially Tyler and Nick, um, is a comic artist by the name of Devin Craft. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's kind of starting to become more and more prominent. I'm really happy for him. Um, he's had a few successful Kickstarters and was actually like featured on IGN a few months ago. Um he attends all of, like the local things, and he has occasional let us just like share a part of his booth, which has been really awesome of him. Um, but yeah, uh, that's always fun when you have somebody who can who can sneak you in like that. Yeah, I was actually kind of curious about uh, Unity Five though, and how you're liking the development uh, process in the new version. Um, I have honestly not touched it. Um, all that I did is I just cut the check and then sent the licenses to people. <laughs> yeah, producer work. Yeah, exactly. Um, they seem to like it so far. Um, they could go into much more detail with it. I honestly haven't even looked at it yet. Wish cool, I could give cool. you more. Yeah, I was, I was just a little curious, but um, yeah, because uh, I know it's it's that's the version that came out um, very recently, a few months ago, right? Uh, like not December, I think. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so uh, Carson, what are you guys up to? Let's see, the, um, the game is Megalomaniac, correct? Yes, yes. So I guess I'm a, I'm a little bit different in that uh, our first project is a tabletop project. It is sort of a, you know, a medium that you don't see a ton of, but it's also a lot of fun to work in. Um, it's been a blast working on it so far. Been at it for about a year now. We're, we like to say we're in late beta. Uh, the toughest part is we have 200 unique pieces of artwork, mm -hmm. which means 200 hand-drawn images, which takes forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, all together, it's been great. Um, yeah, like I just said, we just went to Pack South and we did great traffic. A lot of people sat down and played it. Uh, we got great. We were still on the fence with a sort of was there a market for this game? And when you sit down, and you have everybody who stops, looks at your sign, walks up, and says, "Okay, 
what's going on here? You give them the pitch, and they want to automatically sit down and play a game. You kind of feel like you're doing something right. So, so what is the pitch? Why not explain the game for us? Okay, so I had to cut this from like two minutes down to thirty seconds. <laughs> the easiest way to explain it is this. Um, now I know you guys have seen this, but you remember old James Bond movies? Yeah, yeah. How uh, the villain always had some crazy convoluted plan to take over the world. Mm. Well, that's to us that was always the most interesting part of the movie. So what we did is we kind of took care of the pesky little super spy and we've already locked him away and he's taken care of. And now we're giving you and your friends the chance to enact your crazy plot to take over the world. <laughs> uh, we're using a lot of archetypal villains. So, you know, you have your normal mob boss, your scientist. And then we're getting into some fun stuff like the environmentalist who, for some reason, wants trees to overgrow everything. Although it <laughs> doesn't really leave him anything to rule. <laughs> or the, an- the, uh, the animal master who doesn't necessarily think, think through the fact that he's employing giant angry T-Rexes to do his bidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's very self-aware. Mm. You know, the game understands, you know, it's kind of stupid. Mm. But it, it kind of revels in that. And... Uh, yeah, it's really our love letter, love letter to board games. Mm. Uh, and I've actually played a little bit. It's a pretty cool game. Um, the, uh, the the mechanic, I guess, is that you're kind of building up your base and you're hiring workers and you're trying to collect parts for your big super weapon. Um, but then it's also kind of got this uh, indirect competition element to it where you're trying to, one, race other people to get the, the parts, but also you, like, you can attack their base and kind of screw with them and sabotage them and try to um, make sure that you're the one who gets there first. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, th- go ahead. Jim? Oh, I was just going to ask uh, for, you know, listeners that might be curious about the game. Um, could you, is, are there any other board games that you could compare it to and say it's kind of like this mixed with this or to give them an idea? Do you want the short list or the long list? <laughs> <laughs> short list. <laughs> short list, uh, short list. Um, Start with the little Illuminati, add some Ascension and Dominion, toss mm-hmm. in a little Twilight Imperium for fun, and then... Add a layer of uh, comedy to it, and you've got a general idea. Twilight Imperium for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Just toss that in. How, yeah, uh, for this, those who don't know, Twilight Imperium is insane. Yeah, and, and also and that's, the games that's are very long too, like. which is what I was going to ask. Yeah, is, like is, are the games and this is not are long. your games no. very no. long, or are they more self-contained, short? No. Uh, and, and it's about an hour. We have a way. We have a way. If you want to play a quicker game, you can make that happen. Um, the part we loved about Twilight Imperium is how the game is always sort of in flux. Mm-hmm. That even though you may have the biggest lead in the world, three cards can change the entire course of the game. So we add a lot of that in to where that uh, the game's never really over. You, depending on your play style, it can be the last turn and you can pull out a victory. Mm. So you always, as a uh, as a megalomaniac, have to uh, be aware of your competition. Are you? Um, how many people play? Uh, three to five. Three to five. And are you competing in, like, say, separate worlds, or are you all competing to try to take over the same map, if you will? So, like, if you have the environmentalist who is trying to take it over with trees, is that going to affect whatever your particular goal is? Yes. Okay. Uh, they are, you're all competing for the same world. The easiest way to put it is James Bond suddenly disappeared, and everybody who's crazy wants to okay. take over the planet. Um, so you are competing with everybody at the table. So your goals are in conflict. And that means you have to pay attention. Neat. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's it's very much. We've had games where people didn't pay attention, and that's where you get the last minute wins because you weren't paying attention to the guy next to you, lay like, literally play you into his hand, and then beat you on the last turn. Fun. I remember when I was uh, play testing with you guys. It was my first time checking it out. And you guys have been obviously doing a ton of play testing yourselves because you're the developers. Um, but like I was accidentally using just a lot of super cutthroat tactics that mm-hmm. I didn't know were like cutthroat <laughs> tactics. Um, like for instance, destroying um, the parts that are required to build the super weapons because there's a there's a limited number of those <laughs> in the deck, and so I would destroy those because I didn't need them. And they're like, "What have you done?" <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I was able to block them from winning, and that's how I ended up winning. So yeah. it was it was very, it's a really interesting game. It's a fun game. So cool. I enjoy it. And when are you looking to release? Uh, we really want to be out on shelves by June. Um, okay. We'll be going to Kickstarter within the next month or so. Cool. Oh, nice. um, like I said, it all comes down to how fast can we turn over art. Right. The mechanics are sound. Uh, we're doing some last-minute tweaking and testing. But as far as that goes, it really comes down to getting the final look and feel of the game done. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Are you, are you looking to actually go with a publisher to help you get to a broader audience, or are you just going to start selling locally, and how are you going to manufacture We're going we're to start selling locally. We're using Ad Magic to print. Okay. Um, Ad Magic usually does a pretty good job as far as short or long runs. They, mm-hmm. you know, they're used to working with uh, smaller uh, projects and smaller developers to get their games out. 
Um, we we want to sell ourselves if possible. If not, we are open to working with publishers. It's mm. simple as that. The biggest thing for us is we want this game to come out. Yeah. Yeah. We want to see our vision come to fruition. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I don't know if you ran into, uh, when you were at PAX South, if you ran into um, a gentleman by the name of Tomer Braff, mm. who's uh, from Giant Shoulder Productions. He has a board game. He's a current student here at UTD, and he has a board game that actually he just signed on with a publisher. Yeah, I saw him. Uh, Ad, Ad Magic actually put their boat together. Oh, cool. I got to run down there and shake his hand and say hi. Uh, it's Circular Reasoning, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know the name of the game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's an interesting game. It really is. Um, I've thought about it. If this gets far enough along, actually calling Ad Magic and saying, hey, do you want to publish this? Can we sure. work on a deal? Or going to somebody like Steve Jackson yeah. or uh, possibly. Uh, I don't want to talk about that one yet. But. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely on the table. Publisher, especially like at at this point, like it's kind of one of those things that a lot of people see. Like the reason that we're the reason that you do indie development and the reason that you do like independent publishing is because you get to control everything, right? But like, um, it's always that weird um, dichotomy of using their resources to then grow your own. And so like then even if you take a lesser amount now, does that help to grow your audience so that then you don't need them in the future? Right. Um, it's always that really weird choice and we're kind of going through that right now ourselves. I was it's, actually reading an article yeah. on uh, Gama Sutra recently that was talking about um, our publishers back in style now mm. because we kind of had like a little a few years where like the big thing to do was be ND and to control everything and like have your own vision and all this different stuff but now that uh, the market is like totally saturated with self-published stuff both you know in mobile and in PC and other stuff like that um, you know the publisher can help you kind of get your name out there um, but I think, like, you know, the, the, the thing they were kind of focusing on was, like, you know, are you willing to share a bit of your profits with the publisher in exchange for the, you know, the services they provide, like publicity and that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. Um, but I think the other thing that can happen, too, is that they can kind of just give you that name recognition that kind of gives you a little bit more credibility. Exactly. I think we have so many people, like, you know, Kickstarter is a great example of just, like, all these sort of half-baked ideas that get thrown up there. Even if they look cool, they might never actually happen. And so it's like, hey, this publisher's on board, and it's a publisher that a lot of people know, a lot of people buy games from. It ought to be good, you know? Right. And that that alone is something yeah. that's worth considering a publisher for. It, yeah. It, it legitimizes the project, which I think is something that is missing from a lot of those uh, that you were talking about, the Kickstarter indie projects. Some people have been burned because they're not sure it's actually going to work out or ever, ever actually come to fruition. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that is something really cool that publishers can add to the process. Yeah. Or how many people that miss out on a project because or don't learn about it until like years later just simply because they didn't have like on that particular project, they didn't have like the social media push or just the audience and the fan base yeah. to actually get the word out enough until right. their third or fourth title. title. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's that, thing. The elephant in the room we're not talking about is simply money. Yeah. I can tell you that things are made a lot easier when you have funding and you can actually go to people and say, hey, I will pay you to do this. Things mm-hmm. get done faster. <laughs> yeah. Things get done better. Mm. Yeah. Instead of, you know, working out contracts where people are getting residuals or, you know, you're promising payment down the line. It just helps to have cash in hand. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, so I think this is a good opportunity to transition back to uh, the topic of, of sports and sports games. And I know I spoke with Chris a bit earlier, and uh, he wanted to sort of talk about the difference between the arcade sports title and the simulation sports title and how there's a whole bunch of um, sort of a gradient in between those. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about uh, the, um, the trend that's been going on for a while uh, now with, uh, within the NFL and other sports leagues where... Um, someone will come out, sometimes these even get on ESPN, they'll, they'll simulate the game in, say, uh, in this case, uh, Madden 15, they'll simulate mm-hmm. the, uh, the Super Bowl, and they'll say, oh, well, according to Madden, um, the Seahawks will win by, like, 20 points, or, you know, whatever happens according to their simulation, and then you get to see the game, and you get to see how it plays out, and it almost never plays out the same way. <laughs> um, sometimes the scores can get really ridiculous on these simulation games and don't really make a lot of sense. But um, it's, I think it's, what they, it's fun to I think what they do with the Madden thing... Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. I think what they do with the Madden thing too is they'll actually simulate it like a thousand games. Like so, those those simulations that like it's not necessarily Madden, but um, people have developed these simulations. Like we ran the simulation a thousand times, and this percentage of the time this team won, that sort of thing. Um, and I think right. what they do is when they show you the footage, they kind of like said, "Here's kind of like the average game that played out." We said like this touchdown happened around this time, that sort of thing. Well, they, um, but they yeah, do. it's a really interesting. Um, it, even if it doesn't pan out. Right. No, yeah, they, they do both. They do they do have, like, um, all those simulations that they go through, but then they'll also 
Um, sometimes they'll take specific video game footage and specific games, and I'm sure it has something to do mm -hmm. with like um, cross promotion. You know, maybe they have a deal with you know for whatever sort of advertising rights for EA or what have you. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. but along those same lines, I thought it would be really cool because I'm kind of a retro game guy, like um, you know older style games, kind of what I grew up with. And uh, one of the games I remember playing back um, way back in the day on the NES was uh, Tecmo Super Bowl. Which was before you continue, I have to ask you a question. Yeah, here. go for it. Are you one of those people that play with Bo Jackson? Because if you are, <laughs> you're the worst. <laughs> oh, I, I sure the hell did play with Bo Jackson, but I didn't in this version. That that I and I'm going to tell you why. Um, because I, I totally did. Yeah, Bo Jackson was really broken. That's kind of one of the one of the, one of the jokes in uh, Tecmo Super Bowl. Um, the cool thing about that game, though, is that it was the first um, sports game, uh, the first uh, of the Tecmo series that had the NFL license and was able to use all the licensed players, and it got really big for that reason. Um, but it came out in 1991, so it didn't really, it doesn't really have all the teams that we have now, and of course doesn't have the same rosters. Well, um, I kind of got it in my head that I wanted to play out a simulation in Tecmo Super Bowl to see how um, the Super Bowl may go down in that version of the game. And as I was looking through the internet to see, you know, maybe has anyone else tried this, etc., um, I, I found that there's actually this mod by a team known as uh, TecmoBowl.org, and um, they've released Tecmo Bowl 2015, and it is a <laughs> version of Tecmo Bowl, of Tecmo Super Bowl, I'm sorry, because um, Tecmo Bowl didn't have the actual uh, player roster, um, real teams. But anyway, Tecmo Super Bowl 2015 has the uh, uh, NFL 2014-2015 season rosters, and it also goes back in and adds in all the new teams that have been added to the NFL since 1991. So it has all the teams. It also moved the Seahawks, which used to be in the AFC, into the NFC as they are now. So you know, it went through. It did made all these changes, and um, I went through and I uh, um, actually went through all the trouble of simulating all the way through to the um, Super Bowl in Tecmo Super Bowl, so that I could actually collect the footage of the halftime show and all of that as well, which I thought was actually pretty cool to see um, the halftime show again. Um, from that game, which is, which is kind of a real treat. Um, I won't spoil the winner from, from the Tecmo Super Bowl uh, 2015, but I will say that um, it is a, an interesting game and it should be fun to uh, uh, check out. I'm going to post that up on Battle Compatible um, Sunday morning before the actual game starts. So, cool. um, yeah, so you're going to try to compete out. with the Puppy Bowl then? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going I'm to compete with the Puppy Bowl, I guess. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I sim the entire game. Uh, computers, I didn't play either side. I didn't, I didn't play favorites. Um, I have my own favorite for who I want to win, but that doesn't matter for this. It's just a one-time simulation. Didn't bother to, to resim it multiple times or any of that. So, um, you know, whatever happens, that's going to be the result that I'm going to post up. So my question for you now then is, um, can Tecmo Super Bowl actually account for changes in ball pressure? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say that they, the, the guys that, um, that the TecmoBowl.org um, modders, they did actually go through all the trouble of adding in not just the players, and, but also the player likenesses as far as art. And they also went through oh, and wow. did all of the um, you know stat. They tried to make the stats more realistic for the way that the players are um, on all of the teams, which I'm sure was a, a lot of work. So it, it, it is actually pretty cool that they actually will have, you know, Tom Brady's there, Russell Wilson's there, that all the players are there and you can actually see them play um, in Tecmo Super Bowl. But as far as things like the deflate gate controversy and, and ball <laughs> pressure, um, no, unless someone went back and added an extra mod. That would be kind of cool, though. You can go back and you can have a hack where you have like a slightly deflate ball that you're using. See if that makes a big difference. <laughs> So speaking of mini rant, I'm so tired of the suffix gate. Mm, Can we please yeah. stop using gate after every it's, controversy? This is now gate gate. Okay, thank you. Rant off. <laughs> we're, we're in gate gate. We're like the, the, the now now the new controversy is there's too many yes. gates. Yeah. So we're in suff <laughs> suffix. Or maybe suffix gate gate twenty fifteen. <laughs> I'm actually tempted to do that. <laughs> anyway. Or stop the gate instead of you know stop the hate campaigns. Let's we stop the gate. Ooh, uh, I do like that. that. Actually, that's good. Yeah. That's good because then we're not using gate gate. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's cool. Um, and that's cool that you looked that up. I remember reading um, something about that, I think, a few years ago, like when they had redone it, like in 2013 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I've always meant to go take a look at it. 
Um, Because I think, like, again, um, since they actually have, like, a dedicated sports game writer on Kotaku, I think he follows it at the beginning of every year and, like, makes an article about it, like, with the updates and essentially just checking in with them as to whether or not they're still updating every single year. Sure enough, they're (laughs) they're still going, which is just fascinating. That's pretty cool. Mod mod communities in general just fascinate me because it's just – it's so much work to keep that up, and it's for something that's just an endeavor of just love for a Mm -hmm. specific game. Um, I think that I remember hearing um, that there's other games that do this, like – for one reason or another, one random NHL game for, like, Genesis, there's, like, mm. a community around that that does that. Um, and I know that there's one that does uh, NFL 2K5 also. Oh, because really? a lot of people still consider that, like, the best football game ever made. Uh, huh. but, uh, it's starting to start for EA games, too. Uh, now, there's a, <clears throat> now that there's no college football, Sony mm. goes in and goes on uh, NCAA 14 and updates every year with prospects and current college wow. rosters. Hmm. That is really cool that, that the modding modic communities can build up around these games and stay dedicated for so many years. It, it really kind of speaks to, to um, yeah. not just the passion they have for the game, but there, there must be something in that game that is just sort of like it transcends its time period that it's released in. It's like it's, it's little because I know that nowadays there's this trend and we talked about this last week on the podcast, but there's this trend to try to release uh, to release a game that you don't really, that the developers may not necessarily want you to play for an extended period of time because they want you to move on to their next big release. Speaking of AAA games, they want you to play the game and mm. you know st- suck uh, suck your time into it, spend your time into it. But then when you're done, move on to the next release that they have that's going to come out. They don't necessarily want you to latch onto a game for years because if you're latched onto this one game for years, maybe you won't buy into all of their other games that are coming out. Um, so yeah, I do think it, it, it kind of says something, especially since a lot of these mod communities tend to pop up over um, either older games or you get this real dedication around uh, some of the, the newer indie titles. I'm seeing that some with those as well. Yeah, so I think what we wanted to talk about today was, um, uh, and I guess we can sort of like hit it off on this, but kind of um, sports games. Um, that you know are trying to you know recreate the sport in a video game. And of course, this started way back when. You know, Tech Mobile, Tech Mobile being a good example. Um, and you know, today we have franchises like Madden are um, just as big as anything else. You know, on a yearly basis, they're one of the top selling games of all time. Um, and so, like you know, that doesn't necessarily get covered all too often, just because you know, for one, we people who actually follow video games, like it's just like, oh yes, there's another Madden this year. But, um, I mean, they really do sell a lot of copies. And, you know, people who are in the industry actually understand that um, if you're releasing, I think it's in the summer they typically come out, um, that you're competing with the likes of Madden and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, there's kind of like this this range of um, games that try to be a little bit more simulationist and try to recreate every aspect of the game, like your Maddens, your 2Ks. Um, You know, even games like Jim mentioned earlier before we started, um, Football Manager. You don't even see the games. It just plays out numerically, and then you just sort of base your decisions on that. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've kind of got the arcade-style games, things like NBA Jam um, and uh, NFL Blitz that try to sort of recreate certain like p- particular parts of the game and try to simplify it and make it you know easy to pick up easy to play um you know kind of quick play and then i think there's kind of like an in between where you've got stuff like um you know mario golf that's actually pretty um advanced you know it, it simplifies a lot of things and it kind of plays around with some of the different mechanics lets you do things that you couldn't do in real golf um yet i think it's one of, like the better golf video games out there um what do you guys like to play as far as sports games are concerned uh I mean, I still cling to some of the old arcade stuff. Uh, we had a real golden age of arcade games around the PS2, uh, Xbox era, when uh, you had things like new NBA jams, MLB Slug, Slugfest, NFL, uh, the return of NFL Bliss, and on top of that, you had stuff like NFL Street, mm-hmm. where uh, you could just have fun with the games. Um, I used to be a big Madden player, Madden that since lost its shine, mm-hmm. it's... it's you know, I still pick. I still pick it up and play, but I, it's not something I'm going to dump. You know, forty, fifty hours into my franchise and yeah, get yeah. to twenty, thirty five and have ten Super Bowl championships. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no uh, arcade. I still I play a lot of NBA Jam on Fire Edition. Um, still one of the the best basketball games I've ever played. Still a lot of fun. It feels like NBA Jam. Mm-hmm. I think that for me, it largely depends on exactly what game it is, um, and and partially the experience that I'm trying to that I'm trying to have with that particular one. Um, so, like, if you take something like basketball right now, um, I actually have a really big issue with basketball games that are out currently, um, just largely because um, 
10 years ago or so when NBA 2K was going strong and when, uh, uh, oh, God, what's the EA one? Because they've changed the name so many times. NBA Live, yeah, because they changed the name so many times <laughs> through those years. Um, and then through that long um, period where it was on hiatus and then they kept pushing <clears throat> it back each year, I suppose, release it, never did. Um, I was always a bigger fan of NBA Live. And the reason why is because it is definitely, of the two of them, even though it is still more of, like, if, if you were looking at the broad spectrum, I guess it would kind of go more towards simulation in the fact that it does use all of all of the 30 NBA teams and um, actual players and, mm -hmm. like, especially like now, like, track stacks and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it always felt a little bit more of the arcade version of the two of those. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the one thing that we'll always respect about NBA 2K and why every single year it's always up there as, like, one of the best sports games of the year and sometimes the best game of the year is because it is really a true perfect simulation of, like, the game of basketball. Like, mm -hmm. if I am out there and playing and, like, I played a little back in high school, like, I mean, you can actually see the plays um, and how they're played. and You can see them, uh, like, drawn out in your mind's eye and actually see them happen virtually on the court, which is really cool, and that doesn't happen a lot of times in a lot of games and I think that's a really cool way to experience the game but to me that's not fun yeah. um, what, what I want to play is because because then what ends up happening is unless you play like full length quarters in the game mm -hmm. um, because you end up soaking up like the entire 30 second shot clock um, you're going to end up having a professional game that ends like 42 to 38 yeah, or something yeah, right. like that and like what fun is that mm -hmm. like that's that's almost counterintuitive to like the mm -hmm. actual simulation that you're trying to right. um, create and so um, whereas like the NBA like NBA Live I would just simply be able to um, just dunk on every single like I would take my <laughs> I remember like in NBA Live 03 I would just simply ignore Steve Nash on the Mavs I'd ignore Dirk I would just use Michael Finley just go <laughs> ISO every single play and just simply go to the go to the hoop and dunk and like I would win like 120 to 60 and that was, that was fun <laughs> and so like I think in a lot of ways like I mean it's what's the experience that you're trying to create with mm -hmm. a game mm -hmm. and whether or not and sometimes you it's very easy to forget fun when you're talking about these things sure, and I yeah. think that any game the most important thing when you're talking about mm -hmm. it is um, and so this is a challenge that we always pose to ourselves like with our company is mm -hmm. we always have to take a step back and say is this fun yeah. and if it's not then we need to reassess it or and, like you know, sometimes your definition of fun can vary a little bit it can kind of, of be more like is it engaging does it keep me interested that yeah. sort of thing because on the other hand like if you look at um, like a baseball game mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I'm not really a big fan of most baseball games out there just because I, I always say that the hardest thing to do in professional sports is to hit a baseball mm -hmm. and that is also the case in video, game. video games <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, like, one of my favorite baseball games of all time, that's why I was just looking up my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I was just on my phone is not because I was checking Facebook or something. But, like, <laughs> I was actually trying to remember the name of this game. Um, MLB Power Pros, hmm. yes. um, which is a really long-running series from Japan um, that followed, like, the Japanese leagues uh, that finally came over to the States on the Wii. Um, and they actually did two versions. They did 2000. They did MLB Power Pros and then MLB Power Pros 2008. Um, and it's really largely an RPG simulation game. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually do like play the games, um, but it, it places much more importance on the actual stat tracking mm -hmm. and things like that. You actually follow like certain characters like all the way from minor leagues all the way through the pros, and you can act. And so it's a little bit of a manager system, mm -hmm. but it uses like little chibi characters, and it's and it's not like as in in. What's cool is it is one of the most in-depth simulation games that I've ever played, huh. um, and yet it's a really um, low barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, with that game, I find that much more fun. Yeah, so. and It's interesting, too. Another issue, and you kind of touched on it already <clears throat> with um, these kind of simulation of sports games, is when... Um, they try to make sure you can do anything you could do in the sport. So for the 2K example, you said, like, you know, you can play out these um, plays just like you would if you're playing a real basketball game. And if you know all the controls, like, you can press the right button combos to do any sort of, like, dribble move, pass, you know, set up a pick, all sorts of different stuff, which is great. But, you know, I, when I play 2K, first of all, I play on career mode, so I'm only playing as one person, which is actually kind of interesting. It makes it feel more like an action game almost. Um but as you're going through and um, doing that, like, you know, basically I stick to your basic, like, try to steal, try to block, you know, shoot. I know how to do a couple basic dribble moves, like, you know, just using the, the right stick. Um, but I'm not, like, really digging into it. So it's like I enjoy it well enough, but I don't feel like I'm getting the full, um, like, taking full advantage of the game. Um, mm -hmm. Madden, I think, is notorious for, like, you know, for me, if I'm on defense, I just don't even touch the controller. I pick my play and let it play out because I'm just going to mess it up, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, and then, like, you get, like, eight different control types for depending on, like, what sort of action you're doing, what sort of position you're playing currently, um, all sorts of different stuff like that. So it's like, it's great that they're doing that, but, you know, at, some, at the same time, you have to kind of figure out how do you keep it accessible. And I think they, do a decent job at trying to do that, but 
um, a lot of people I imagine like the learning curve might be too steep to really get um, like new players who are just interested because they want to play that sport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely understand that. Um. Okay, yeah. So uh, for me, sports games. Um, aside from recently, you know, playing Tecmo Bowl, um, uh, Tecmo Super Bowl, playing through the the new rosters and all that, which I thought was kind of a trip. Um, the, the sports game or the sports series that I play the most is actually uh, FIFA. I'm, I'm actually a pretty big uh, soccer fan, so I like I, I really do like the the FIFA releases. And um, I, I like to go through playing season mode. I like the, the simulation aspect and also being able to um, create your own player. And you have that kind of an, the RPG element of being able to um, start out on like at, loaned out to some lowly club and build up your stats and get better and better. Um, advance until until finally you're in, um, you know, a top a top league, a top team, and you know, you're playing in all the top tournaments and actually winning trophies. Yeah. So I kind of like the the mixture of um, the, honestly the gameplay pisses me off quite frankly. <laughs> FIFA can be a very frustrating game. Um, there's and, and I mean that in, in not so much that there's anything necessarily wrong with the controls, but there's a lot of behind the scenes. Um, Sort of like rubber banding effects, kind of like they do in mm-hmm. racing games. Mm-hmm. Only, um, based, if you get too far behind, um, suddenly it seems like all your players are gods and they can't be stopped. And the reverse is true also. If you start, you know, sometimes the game it feels like they've chosen a winner at the start, and that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I had to stop playing online after a while because it was just pissing me off too much. I couldn't handle it, um, and it would do it to me too. I, I'd feel like I didn't deserve to win a game, and I'd win um, for basically no reason. I would just feel like my players were unstoppable. And um, that feels good uh, initially until you know it happens to you the other way around. So, um, mm-hmm. but I, I do like the the, ro- the RPG aspect, uh, the RPG element of you have these players with statistics and they rise and fall based on their form and based on um, age, and uh, you can sort of retire and then become a become a manager in most of those games. That I thought was a pretty neat touch where you can transition from player to manager. Um, so yeah, that's that's the one that I have the most experience with. I have played a lot of. Um, um, Madden, especially early Madden. Um, I always preferred the NCAA games, but I did play some Madden as well. And um, NBA Live, I played that a lot in the um, on an emulator on the uh, SNES back in probably the the late '90s, I guess. I used to play that a lot, and um, yeah, I was kind of a, I was an NBA Live junkie for a while for kind of the same reason. I like to like to go through and play every single game in the season. I'm, I'm one of those people. I want to play every game. Mm. I don't want to sim anything. <laughs> Um, I want to have control, but I also want to feel like I'm running through the whole season and playing all the matches. When you started talking about uh, FIFA, Eric was patting his uh, Italia um, hoodie. Yeah, I was just. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually, ironically, I am. I guess it actually works since we're talking sports today. Yeah. I'm, I'm wearing my uh, Italian national, uh, my my Italian national team track jacket right now. <laughs> so and, I, uh, I patted the crest over my heart. Yes. And uh, Carson's got his LSU jersey on. I'm kind of regretting not wearing my Cowboys hoodie right now. So. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's actually funny you bring up the rubber banding in EA games, though. One of the running jokes with Madden is that the game starts cheating sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> because you play a team. Yeah, it does. It, you it play really a does. Team, and there's no way you can win. Mm-hmm. Um, I, just, I mean, I, I've played. I know is on, on FIFA. Um, it gets. It's more ridiculous because at least the teams in the NFL are um, closer in skill level. In FIFA, you can play uh, against a team that is like two or three leagues below you in terms of in terms of you know there's like there's multiple league levels in uh, in soccer in Europe. So you can play a team that's like a couple, like two or three leagues level below you in some of the comp competitions, and sometimes they'll play you as though they're just as good as like Barcelona, and they'll, <laughs> it makes no sense, and you don't, you can't stand it. And then, you know, the very next time around, you'll, you'll play like say Real Madrid in like the Champions League, and they'll play terribly, and it's like they're they're nobodies. They play like nobodies, and so it just feels like you kind of lose that that sense of. Um, pressure that that teams get in reality, and you and you get as a fan when your team is playing against a really good team. You're supposed to feel that pressure, and you lose that when you have that. Well, any team can be really good, and any team can be really bad. Element that that unfortunately creeps into EA games. A friend of mine um, is a big, uh, or used to be a big fan of um, uh, EA's Fight Night, the mm-hmm. boxing. Oh, I, I play um, that one too. Which uh, which uh, boxing, MMA, um, technically motorsports, it can all technically be considered uh, sports mm-hmm. games. But yeah, he uh, he was playing. I forget what year it was, but he was super excited for it to come out, and he was like just playing the hell out of it. And he got to this one fight where the rubber banding was happening because it was like a career mode, and so it's like the the game decided that you were going to lose this fight, and so he played it 
over and <laughs> over and over again. He saw the game was cheating, and like, you know, I thought he was just complaining because it's like, yeah, you can't beat the level, whatever. But I started watching him, and like, he was telling the truth about like how like he'd throw a punch that looked like it was supposed to hit, and the guy would like miraculously not be damaged by it or something like that. Or he'd like dodge it or <laughs> something like crazy. Um, and it's like, well, the game is cheating. Yeah. Like eventually, because like he refused to just lose that fight and move on, because he right. probably would, like would go back to normal after that. But he's like, no, I am going to beat this fight, right. and he never did. And he just never touched the game again. Huh. <laughs> so no fight night. Yeah, there's something kind of interesting happening there that like you you have to wonder about the design choice behind that um, mm-hmm. as to what and like kind of the implication of that rubber banding being there. Mm-hmm. Um, and because uh, on one hand, it uh, it it. Allows it, it allows kind of a more casual audience to play the game, mm-hmm. and and especially if they're typically losing, then to kind of come back. Um, and then on the other hand, it does make it more exciting at times. Like yeah, it, yeah. It, like especially in FIFA, which can be pretty notorious for it. Um, very often, if it is a close match, it it ends up like finishing in like the 89th minute or the 91st minute. Mm-hmm. Um, and like that's the that's the glory of the beautiful game is like mm-hmm. when you do have uh, like amazing moments like that, you kind of get to experience and you get those goosebumps and, mm-hmm. and things like that. And, and yet, you know, like underneath the hood that this is happening and that's not necessarily fair. That's not the way that it should happen. Right. And so like in a sports game, it is, I, I guess that you can look at it as representing momentum mm-hmm. and like the shifting momentum especially in a basketball game and but like that happens in almost any sport mm-hmm. um something that like we talked about you like brought up motorsports and that's mm-hmm. actually like kind of if you were to like categorize like uh, sports games i mm-hmm. think that motorsports games like actually do it really well mm-hmm. um in that you have your pure simulation games like your gran turismos and then you have um kind of your arcade racers mm-hmm. like well what was need for speed and now right. need for speed has kind of started to shift over into or at least it was starting to yeah, shift well, over and now it's kind of moved back again what they've kind of done too is they kind of like split so like they had um need for speed shift i think it was yeah. that was like their motorsports game yeah um to compete with like forza and all that um and then there was like you know um criterion and um i think i forget the other two it was ghost maybe i think you're um, right yeah they like branched off from criterion um who did the Burnout series, Mm -hmm. took over Need for Speed and made it more like Burnout, which was cool. I just miss the uh, the the car carnage that could happen. In <laughs> just being able to initiate a rollout <laughs> yeah. anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not not only that, but like when you'd crash, like you'd actually like you know right. destroy the vehicle. And like there's damage in these Need for Speed new Need for Speed games, but like because of the licensees, right. um, like the licensees don't want the uh, or the licensors, I should say, um, don't want their cars looking too bad because <laughs> it's like wait Never a second, it our way. our yeah. five star crash safety rated car won't crumple like that if you ram into a wall at 200 miles per hour. Well, Stay right. intact. You know, it's like right. no, you'll be dead. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> crumple and explode just yeah. like in burnout. Uh. Yeah, and then on the other end, then you have um, your kart racers, which mm-hmm. are then like just simply if there is like a, a spectrum, like the pure arcade, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, and what's cool about that is then because you have those very defined three categories, mm-hmm. um, any player can kind of find their niche within that. Mm-hmm. And what's really cool about that is whereas like all of these other games where there is only one, like say a Madden or where uh, like something like a FIFA where they try to fit everything into one where you get like the RPG simulation elements of mm-hmm. like career mode and then you get like manager mode and then you have just like normal online mode and things like that right. where it's all in one, it doesn't really necessarily do either to the best of its ability or one really well and then the others two are, aren't really that great mm-hmm. um, they can really focus on what their goal is like I mean Mario Kart especially like Mario Kart 8 like mm-hmm. is just an excellent kart racer mm-hmm. um, and it actually did kind of go into uh, what, what I liked about the new one is it actually did um, kind of start to finally reward skill a little bit better than a lot of other kart racers often do and yet still you can hop in and just simply have fun if you do something at like a lower CC level um, and so like the way that I approach um car like like racing games is i like the idea of like what a fifa would present or like what a madden would present in which i can play as somebody and like kind of role play as somebody who would actually be a professional in whatever sport this is and yet i am terrible at this style of game and so it makes me feel better and empowers me um and so i really like my favorite racing game of all time is uh grid and the reason I like that so much is it's set up, at least from a presentation perspective, uh, just like Gran Turismo and Forza, um, mm-hmm. as if it is a simulation racer and you use real cars that are on real tracks. 
and yet the way that it actually plays, the gameplay is actually much more like an arcade racer. You can mm-hmm. you can actually go into corners a little too fast, and you're okay. Right, and right. Um, and, a, and one of the coolest features that it did that then other racing games started to kind of introduce as well that no simulation ever would have beforehand was the flashback feature, which mm-hmm. allowed you, like, if you did mess up a corner, um, you could then just go back, like, five seconds mm-hmm. and then do it again. Mm-hmm. That's um, interesting. Yeah, which is really neat. And because just, I, I know there are a lot of, like, obsessive-compulsive type gamers, quote-unquote, they, like, uh, it, it's kind of a... a it's an ongoing joke with anyone who plays a lot of racing games that if you mess up one turn or mm-hmm. run into something once, you restart the race. Right. Because you know you can't possibly win. So I like that flashback feature because it takes like it lets you not have to restart the entire race just to make up for that one mistake that you made. Exactly. Right. And, and there's a really strong community around Grid that is still going now, even though Grid, like even with Grid 2 coming out, and I haven't really played around with it a whole... Mm-hmm. I have it, but I haven't been online and like, played with that community. Mm-hmm. Um, that treats it like a simulation racer, and yet like most purists weren't really a very big fan of it because of things like the flashback feature and because of things like tire pressure didn't really matter as much. And mm-hmm. like the things that like uh, some of my friends... Um, actually, Adam um, Nasrallah, who yeah. I know that you have worked with before, he is a a huge racing game fan and that's like all that he plays is Forza and um, well particularly Forza um, he, he's not that big of a fan of Gran Turismo anymore right. but like and that's what he would play and he wouldn't play Grit for that very reason is just mm-hmm. simply because like that's what he wants out of it and if he wanted an arcade racer game then he'd play Burnout or he'd mm-hmm. play Need for Speed or something like yeah, that yeah. but for me Grid really fit that perfect niche in between the two I mean, it's, so it's kind of an interesting case study of like kind of if you categorize these games mm-hmm. um, how does a player fit within that it's actually interesting to bring up Grid because to swing back to boxing, I think EA hit it on the head with Fight Night Champion in that <clears throat> the rubber banding was still going on. But when the game decided you were going to lose, it was very scripted that, hey, this is a fight this guy would have lost. Hmm. It gave, it, it kind of took the whole <clears throat> nastiness of the rubber banding out by building it into the story. Like, hey, something happened to you. If you win this fight, great, but you're not really supposed to. Mm. So superior skill can win a fight, but it's going to be stacked against. So it would kind of tell you ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, and it, it, it really was a story about a guy coming out of jail and mm. fighting his way to the top of, you know, the boxing world. Mm. So it would make sense. Hey, you know, you've only been fighting guys in jail. Now you get out and you've been fighting tomato cans. Your first real fight, you get beat. Mm. Makes sense. It doesn't hurt me nearly as much to have a story reason for it than for me to just be playing, feeling like a champion. Now I fight Rinky, Winky Wright, who I fought eight times, and he knocks me out in the first round. Yeah, I, I had played Fight Night Champ as well. I had a similar experience. Um, one thing that I that I really did like about it and enjoyed was um, the story mode itself because um, I was really surprised at how much um, you know how much I kind of got into that and sort of. Uh, normally in, in, in sports games, you don't even really think about having a story mode. And this one, I felt, did a really good job of making me care about the characters um, in, in the story mode. I don't know if you felt the same way, but that was my experience. That, um, that kind of brings to mind something that like, I've actually thought about a lot with, with sports games, is how to make a player feel the same highs and lows during a season mm-hmm. the way that you would actually like that that actually just happen in professional sports mm-hmm. um, and how to actually essentially bring that rubber banding and like make it not feel like rubber banding and but just simply to h- how do you make a player feel that mm-hmm. without increasing difficulty and like lowering difficulty um, yourself mm-hmm. like I mean I know that a lot of times um, as awesome as it would feel like going through an 82 game season and winning all 82 games mm-hmm. um, or like having like three seasons in a row in Madden in which I had like perfect 16 and 0 seasons and won the Super Bowl. Um, as cool as that feels, that's not real, and you start to break the illusion if you're trying to role play. Right, right. Um, and so that's that's something that's always fascinating. I mean, I don't know if I know the answer mm-hmm. um, as to how to actually get that same feeling oh. of like say like the super like the super hawks the seahawks this year yeah. in which they were they came off of last year's the super bowl champions mm-hmm. they started the season really really well mm-hmm. and then they started to have their dip um yeah. after i think it was like around the cowboys win and mm-hmm. then they had that dip um there there's a little bit of like um uh, there's some tumultuous times in the locker room and percy harvin was traded and then mm-hmm. they had that like three to five game slid mm-hmm. skid and then they came back and just came back stronger than ever and right, they looked right. like the super bowl team that they were right um how do you bring that into a game other than like creating scripted events that then you know you would already lose like how do you make that more natural I, I think an interesting anecdote that kind of relates to that is um, ever since 2K14 um, NBA 2K14 2K15 they have the career mode with like an actual story and so like, you can actually um, have dialogue options and stuff like that which is interesting um, but one of, the, one of the kind of the events that will happen is when you're about to go out and play a game 
you'll get the flu that day mm. um and you'll actually have to go into the game and it affects your stats very heavily like you're you can tell like and even the animations change like after you shoot a basket and make it or something like that instead of doing your usual celebration as you run down the court you're just like oh my god and you're just <laughs> like you know like just trying to like drag yourself back across the court um and so like it really like between the animations and like the way that like you're missing shots that you normally make that sort of thing you really feel like you're sick mm. um and it makes that much more awesome when you go and actually score 30 plus points that game right um because that actually like, the goals like hey show or prove to us you deserve to be out there tonight and we shouldn't have pulled you and so they say score 30 points this game and you try to go out and do it and if you do it it just feels amazing right um and then if you don't do it then in the post-game interviews it's like oh man you know was coach wrong to put you out there <laughs> and sometimes it's weird because like they have this weird threshold where like i got 29 points in the game and not the 30 <laughs> and they said that i was horrible what were you doing out there we should have benched you like all this different stuff it's like i was one point away right. man right. God. Right. <laughs> i mean maybe you could do it through injuries i know a big part yeah. Seahawks this year was, you know, losing guys like KJ Wright and stuff for games. Um, I I play a lot of franchises in Madden. I don't feel injuries play the the uh, role they should. Uh, you know, it, you can get an injury in a game, and it's rare. You know, the RNG in Madden isn't in, isn't hitting injuries all the time. But if you look at a football game, how many times have you seen an injury timeout? Yeah. You know, how many times you see guys who are having great seasons go out for the you know the mm-hmm. entire season? Well, another thing that just came to mind too is. Um, Penalties. Yeah. Um, a lot of times the game can sound to seem, seem to swing based on officiating. And even just in general, these games tend to like turn off or like severely minimize the frequency at which these penalties are called. Um, unless like the player does something really obvious, like you know, go off sides or something like that. Yeah. Um, if they were like, and I know that you can go into the settings typically and turn up the frequency of these calls, but there should be a thing I think in every game where there's an option to say realistic penalty calling um, and make it so that this stuff happens more often. Mm-hmm. And then like you know, if the game wants to revenge you a little bit, you can blame the officials essentially. Right. Um, and it's not just because the other team started playing lights out; it's because you got called for things that might have been questionable. That's sort right. of deal. You know, you didn't get the 50-50 balls. You get your bounces, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. And that, and that, and that creates the highs and lows. So, you know, if you're playing right. as the Seahawks and Marshawn Lynch breaks his leg in week three, he's got to miss six weeks. Okay, that's mm-hmm. you got to deal with Christian Michael and, right. and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I like the idea of doing stuff like that, like something that's external to the actual, like every single game itself, um, mm-hmm. in that it, it creates a bigger challenge to, and, it, and especially if it just simply openly challenges the player in that way of like giving the player the flu or like mm-hmm. having a player get injured, even though you know, like, I mean, the, the one thing that would kind of suck about that is if you start a season in Madden and you know, okay, I'm going to go like 4-0 in my first four games, who am I going to lose? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's going to kind of suck. Yeah, and again, yeah. it, it does kind of break the illusion, mm-hmm. but um, at least it is a step in the right direction. And I think then that's when you can kind of get into the thing where you don't so much, like you, you have more real random random number generation and not mm-hmm. so much the um, the weighted random number generation that tends to happen because like you know the rubber banding is very much dependent on variables we see that this is happening and we're going to adjust to the game in this particular way right. if you make it more random it's like you know playing a tabletop rpg where the gm can still bend things a little bit to make it appropriate to what you're trying to do but you can you're trying to say like okay well this challenge that we weren't expecting just came up and it doesn't matter like when in the season you are or like you know how well you've been performing it's just like you could be doing super horribly and one of the worst things that could have happened happens and mm-hmm. that just has that much more drama to to your ongoing sort of emergent narrative. Yeah. Something cool so, at FIFA. Oh, no, go ahead, Jim. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, are you talking about possibly um, something where uh, you can have a set, of, like, a, like a large set of little, um, I don't want to call them storylines, but they kind of are, like little mini storylines where, for example, um, your star player gets an injury or, mm-hmm. um, you know, in a game you get, you get a call that is like so bad, you know, maybe like you scored a touchdown or something, but they ruled you down, but it was a bullshit call, but you have to deal with it. Things like that. It and was a catch. <laughs> right. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, like, you, you have these little storylines like that, and then, then you have enough of them that you can pepper them in with, with some sort of, like, random generation so that when you play through a season mode, you have to sort of overcome these challenges, and it makes it feel more like when you go through a season, you're, you're, you're overcoming obstacles, and therefore it's like an ongoing story of your season mm-hmm. as opposed to just uh, you play a game, you win, lose, or draw. You play a game, you win, lose, or draw, and then, or, or, or there's no draw if you're not playing soccer. But, <laughs> but, you, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like you, you, you give these storyline yeah. moments, and if you if you have enough of them, they won't feel repetitive, and they they hopefully will feel um, kind of kind of give you that emergent story and that different story every time. Because um, if there's enough, you will only have a certain number each time you go through a through a through a season. You might only experience that one 
particular story like once and maybe five runs through through it with a team in one season. So you could really get a lot of variety and, and a lot of stories through through this. And I think that'd actually be really relatively easy to do, um, just yeah. simply through presentation as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so many so many games try to have um, like a quote unquote realistic like halftime show or something like mm. that, but it's always just simply the same quotes and the same yeah. um, replays each time. But if you were to implement something like a um, Dragon Age Keep type. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like story mm-hmm. and like presentation um, that has a ton of variables that essentially any variable that could happen in the game um, essentially summarizes each week mm-hmm. um, after before like after each game and then summarizing like what happened and then what can be going forward yeah. um, have like an Al Michaels or somebody like talk like mm-hmm. you know, or Bob Costas essentially talk about like what happened here's here's the challenges that they're going through and then essentially like have like a full broadcast if you will to yeah, like yeah. Uh, that approaches it in the same way FIFA kind of does that a little bit mm-hmm. with um, like the news clipping and things like yeah, that yeah. to actually like increase the presentation and like make it a little bit more grandiose mm. um, would actually be pretty cool. So then, while you're getting that emergent narrative, it's not just simply up to the player to recognize that. Yeah. Because um, I think that anytime that you ever ask the player to role play, mm-hmm. then you're 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 asking the wrong question. Right. Um, you you should hope that players want to do that, but then there's plenty of people who don't want to. And so, like, if you were to present that to them, that would actually be a really neat way to do that. I think too having. Um uh, like I, I agree with you, like the newspaper clippings and the broadcasts, you know, games, um, both just because the player can recognize it and because the way they present have decent, you know, emergent story. I think they're actually way ahead of some other genres mm. and are kind of underappreciated in that way. Um, but part of what makes sports interesting to a lot of people isn't so much the sport itself, but the storylines mm-hmm. right. um, and the, the context around all this stuff. And so I think, yeah, like you're saying, if the game was to um, generate more in-depth, more um, kind of aware um, uh, broadcast things like storylines that are happening between like these teams or like this rivalry that's emerged that sort of thing right. almost like the um, uh, the uh, what's the what's it called um, Shadow of Mordor's um, Nemesis system Nemesis system yeah um, you have like a rival player and like you know that's something they had in 2K14 there's a rival player to you but it's like they tell you at the beginning this is your rival and he's always going to be your rival no matter what happens right. you know? um, whereas like if you can actually have people emerge as rivals or teams that emerge as rivals that sort of thing yeah. um and have more um, kind of like off the field stuff. More uh, you can you can kind of do like negotiations and free agency on some of these games where it's like, hey, this team's interested in you or this team's interested. In you. you can negotiate like, well, I want a player option if I'm going to go here, that sort of thing. Um, but make that a bigger part of the game. Let it actually come to life more because the off the field stuff sometimes can be just as dramatic as what uh, what's actually happening on the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting you brought up off the field because I was going to mention player tendencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, Add in things like has this guy does this guy have a criminal record? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, has he been suspended before? Like mm-hmm. if you're playing the Lions, do you have to worry about the Duncan Sue from week to week? If you're playing the Browns, do you have to worry about Josh Gordon missing the entire season? <laughs> <laughs> just. Just yeah. think, little things like that. So you've got to worry. Hey, if I lose Josh, you know, if I'm if I'm throwing the ball to Josh Gordon every play, what if I lose him in week six to a drug test? What do I do? Right. Or like I said, yeah, it might. It's the playoffs. But Sue had two personal fouls. Is the commissioner going to suspend him for the next game? Just. All these other things that can add another layer of strategy to the game. Yeah, well, it's yeah. cool. It's a lot, of, and then you can take it even farther. And a lot of it could be like player choice as well, um, and unintended consequences based on actions. Like if you're able to give players choices, especially like if it is like a management mode in which you like, can control the owner and the mm-hmm. coach as well. Um, in that, after the first penalty um, on Sue. You should have pulled him from the game, and if you had pulled him from the game, then of course, then he would have been fine. You know that unintended consequence. Um, maybe if you go to Josh Gordon too much, and like he has like three like record games or mm-hmm. something like that, um, maybe he's living on a high, and like he's just, and then he wants to go out and celebrate, mm-hmm. and then that was the catalyst that then caused him to be bad. Like if to you, then if go you, off, and if you don't tell the equipment guy to uh, go and deflate his balls, <laughs> you're just not going to die, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm making fun of that whole thing in a way. But, uh, it, it has been an amusing uh, storyline, which it's it's funny because a lot of people I listen to a lot of sports radio, and a lot of people are wondering if that's all just meant like the NFL likes it because it distracts from the other controversies that's been happening this past year. Sure, I uh, think it's really just because they. It, it, I think it's really just an effect of the fact that there isn't a game mm-hmm. in between the championship games and the Super Bowl, yeah. and they have to have something to talk yeah. about. Yeah, and nobody cares about the Pro Bowl and, anymore. Right, <laughs> and it's also it was the perfect storm because it was the one team that's been caught for cheating yep. in a very yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah. So instead of us, instead of it being, hey, don't do that. It's hey, you have a record. Now we have to do something to you. Yeah, and speaking of storylines, like I mean, what's what's fascinating is 
there's so many storylines around the concept of the Seahawks versus the Pats in that, um, ironically, you actually have, and you kind of had this last year with the Broncos as well, but especially with the Pats, you literally have the whitest team in the NFL versus the blackest team. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, that, and that's kind of been, like, you know, it actually is, yeah. Um, and then you have, like, I mean, as many people who don't like the Patriots and, like, they, like, especially during the 2000s were slowly becoming the Yankees of the NFL, like, I think that because nobody, <laughs> in, a, in a, like, with a mass populace, nobody likes a winner, suddenly the Seahawks, <laughs> like, are, like, the bane of, like, most of the NFL fans' existence, which totally just I don't get, but, like, I also love the city of Seattle, so, yeah, like, yeah. I have no problem. I, I've got family up there. So yeah, so, yeah. i um, cool with it. And I love their swagger, but, um, and so, like, it was all perfectly set up for, um, the Seahawks to be kind of the nemesis in this game and everybody, like all of America, is going to be cheering for the Pats just as they were all cheering for the Broncos last year, it feels like. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it suddenly made them a villain as well. And so now you've kind of given people... Um, a catch twenty two against this, and it's kind of its own storyline as well. It's just a lot of kind of yeah. fun, like narrative things. If you were to kind of look at yeah. just like what what are the storylines and narrative that's going on there? I'd, I'd be really right. interested to see. Like, I, I think what we're kind of getting at is like we want more of we want we want sports games not just to simulate the sport, but we want to kind of recreate the experience yeah. of the sport in general. And so I'm kind of thinking like you know you got a lot of Bioware games where it's basically like Bioware style story with like either like you know fantasy RPG gameplay or third person shooter gameplay or whatever the case may be why not make the gameplay a sports game mm. and you know like you kind of have like this sort of RPG narrative experience and it's actually not too hard to do branches that way because like each game is either win or lose or draw right um, and depending on what happens there that could sort of affect how the story goes did you happen to play well I got two examples here mm-hmm. uh, did you play Blitz the Lake um, I heard about that one that's actually very interesting because Blitz the League did a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it did it well. <laughs> Wasn't that the one where like you could um, like shoot someone up to like make sure they didn't go out of the game, or like tell someone to break someone's leg or something like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. It, it had a course stuff. It was. I, I like to call it a uh, the program, the movie. If you've ever seen that old uh, movie about Florida State and how the Florida State football program ran, mm-hmm. uh, so I think giving that another chance with a slightly better developer could be awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the Blitz series that kind of died, so the the people making the Blitz series, they kind of moved on, mm-hmm. so you didn't get the same good football action. Well, but Midway I, died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it uh, it felt really cool, you know, having the storylines of the interaction in the uh, locker room and the team sort of falling apart and then having to make decisions, hey, this dude's got a broken leg. I can give him a painkiller, he can finish the game, but I'm going to lose it for the season. Mm. Or I pull him and I get it back in six weeks. Right, right. Uh, the other example, and I think 2K should bring this over to their basketball, is what they do with WWE. Mm. Having <laughs> having mm. WWE... That's what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. is uh, having it be that you don't want to win every match, mm. but you want to put on a good match. You want to you know understand the politics of backstage. You mm. want to make sure that you're putting on the right faces and making the right friends. Sort of lift that out of WWE and stick it into, let's say, NBA 2K15. Huh. Now, the harder part is... WWE is scripted. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's meant to be a soap opera with wrestling. Right. Yeah. And trying to make that fit in basketball. Can be tough. I'm addicted to abortions. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> uh, I, apparently, nobody's seen that South Park episode. No. Uh, uh, yes, the wrestling South Park episode? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, in, in, in the NBA games, you're talking about possibly trying to build your brand, like, as a player to try to, you know, you kind of want to market yourself, not necessarily win every game. Well, yeah, is that kind of what you're, what you're getting at? Some of that, yes. But also, you know, in contract negotiations, uh, do you go to New York even though they may have a slightly worse team but you'll make more money? Mm-hmm. Uh, just a whole lot of things that go into an NBA player's career and mm-hmm. story. They kind of have that right now in 2K, but I don't think it's explored nearly enough. If they expounded yeah. upon that. Um, and like really made that a big part of the gameplay because I was actually really looking forward to that last time. Part of it was because it was buggy. Um, I couldn't really do it properly, but it's it's really kind of minimized. And the focus right now really is on the. And it, it makes sense because it's a yearly sports franchise. They're trying to focus on making sure that the core gameplay is good and it's updated, and you know all the rosters are correct, and all the arts correct, all that sort of stuff. But I kind of want to I want to see a sports franchise that comes out that doesn't come out every year, but actually like crafts a good experience. They're like really focuses on the drama of the sport, mm-hmm. and then it kind of maybe do that every 
three or four years, maybe, instead of every year. And I think that what I'd like to see, like, out of, like, the discussion that we're talking about is it's, they're getting there and they're doing a better job, like, with, uh, like, the individual player and, like, their storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I mean, there's there's a lot that you can do with that. You can make that relatively script and follow, mm-hmm. like, a very certain linear paths. Mm-hmm. Um, what I would like to see is on a broader scale of how do you get that into a career mode mm-hmm. um, with some of the things that we were talking about with that. Um, and, and, and I think that we were kind of along the right path mm-hmm. in the idea of... Uh, that there could be many random, um, you had mentioned like RNG, there could be v- many different random things in storylines that could happen to a team based on like, and, and, and I mean, the, some of the really cool stuff um, is could even come down to, especially, like you had mentioned equipment managers, like really seriously, like if um, part of your staff, like a decision that you would have to make would be based on, um, do you hire a new offensive coordinator mm. or you know that your team over the past few years has been having injury problems maybe you need to take another look and get a better uh, like uh, training staff or something mm-hmm. like that yeah, yeah. Um, like I mean I think there's a lot that could be done there something that FIFA does actually um, pretty well is like uh, and I think that it simulates like the European game really well is the fact that you play so many games over a season, especially one of the better teams, because you have all of your league, your domestic league matches, mm-hmm. and then you have Champions League or yeah, Euro yeah. League, and then you have players who are going off and playing like national mm-hmm. uh, team games and things like that. That you don't, most players don't play every single game because then right. they'd be asked to play like three times a week suddenly, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you really do have fatigue issues, and you actually have like just simply a bar that shows that. Yeah. Um, and that could very easily be implemented into other games. That's just like one very quick solution mm-hmm. to in, to create that challenge over a football season. Um, and I think that in football that would be a little bit difficult because if somebody remains healthy, they can play all 16 games. Mm-hmm. But like in, into a basketball season or like into a hockey game, um, I think that would be really possible. And just that's just one solution to create mm-hmm. um, artificial challenge for the player um, game in and game out that then you could add and layer on top of. In football, you probably factor in age since the biggest thing is in the NFL, the NFL is very a very cutthroat league. Mm. If you have a player who's 31, maybe he gets tied a little bit sooner. Maybe you have to think about cutting him and getting a younger guy. You can have a lot of fun in the offseason with, okay, how do I do I re-sign this guy who's 28 who I think may be hitting a wall? Do I think I can get one more good year out of him? Or do I go try and take a gamble in the draft? There's a lot of that you could interplay. Uh, you're talking about the 16 game. Do you platoon guys? Do you have a good backup mm-hmm. that you can say, hey, this guy wasn't playing well, let me swap him in? Or if somebody has a, four, a bad four-game stretch, do you bench him at the cost of you know his confidence yeah. or something like that? All those can be adjusted depending on how uh, how you manage your players. Yeah, and very easy, like Bioware, Telltale um, effects that could be added into it. Mm-hmm. You, know, and, um, you bench... Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of like one particular player that would be out there. You decide to bench, um, I don't know, say like next season Marshawn Lynch re-signs with the Seahawks and he has a bad game and you bench him for Christian Michael or somebody like that and then suddenly pops up Marshawn Lynch remembers. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> or Mar- Marshawn Lynch like, strongly disapproved. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and then depending on that particular player, um, does that then motivate them to then be better the next week or does then essentially that ruin the player? And, and then it, you can bring in like uh, some games already try to have like a personality built in. Right. The personality can affect the results of such things things like that mm-hmm. so yeah you know uh, you have trade request mm-hmm. does marshall request a trade does that do you have to now find a way to move it right and with that personality stuff too uh i would always prefer that they keep that stuff kind of hidden from the player so you don't you kind of mm-hmm. have to learn the way that your player learn their personality to say being benched right like well if they're benched are they going to get so motivated that next time they come out they're just gonna you know have the best game of their life or are they going to feel you know, dejected and depressed and play terribly next time. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to kind of learn that by sort of trial and error, which is, you know, how it would really be. Maybe you could have a scout report that, you know, keeps track or something like that. If you have like a good scout, you're going to scout something like that to look over your team, that sort of thing, look at their personality. But you're not going to know that right off the bat. You kind of have to experiment. Right. Cool. All right. right, So um, I think it's about time for us to start wrapping things up. Um, before we go, though, I want to get your guys' uh, picks for the Super Bowl. I'm not going to ask you to name points, but who do you think is going to who do you think is going to win? Um, I think that it is crazy. Um, at any point, I think that the Pats have proven that you should never ever forget that they are the best team in the NFL and <laughs> have been for the last 15 years or so. Um, but I can't imagine the Seahawks losing this game. Uh, they just seem too good, too dominant. Um, mm-hmm. The one thing, I mean, I think just like every single one of the Pats games, I think it'll come down to whether or not Gronk Gronks or not. Um, <laughs> but if anybody can stop them, I, I really feel that uh, the Seattle secondary probably can. And I think uh, 
I think, and I hope it'll be the Seahawks coming through. So, yeah. uh, I gotta go Seahawks. Uh, the best piece of uh, analysis I've heard all week is that the Seahawks don't do anything different. They just play cover mm-hmm. three and say, "Come beat us." Mm-hmm. Uh, anytime that anytime a team is able to do that, that gives them a gigantic advantage. You're not looking across this field scared of Gronk. You're saying, okay, Cam Chancellor's got that. You're not looking at a, a Julian Edelman, Edelman scared. You say, hey, we've got three or four corners that can cover him. He just line up and say, okay, we're better than you. Come beat us. Mm-hmm. And that's that's all. Football is 90 percent mentality. If you walk out saying you're going to win, you got a much better chance of winning. So I'm mm-hmm. going Seahawks. Yeah, Seahawks defense. Um, they've got a pretty solid run game. Probably going to go Seahawks myself, and I'm rooting for the Seahawks anyway. So, yeah. Building off of what uh, you were saying, Karsten, um, I think uh, Seahawks as well because of their you know mental boost from uh, that game against the Packers. Um, I kind of think that they looked defensively kind of uh, you know beaten for a while there, and they, they were able to come back and win that game. And I think they have such a mental boost from that that they're going to take that on and win the Super Bowl. So I think Seahawks will win, but I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. Well, I agree. Backward compatible like Seattle. So there we <laughs> are. And Seattle is a bigger uh, gaming city than uh, anywhere in New England. So there you go. Well, I mean, you know, Massachusetts has got a few. But yeah. Anyway. yeah. It's, not, it's not Seattle. Yeah, it's not Seattle. <laughs> Nintendo's up there for crying out loud. <laughs> so anyway. Don't they um, own the Mariners? No, for real. Nintendo owns the Mariners. Uh, the um, I do know they advertise the 3DS. One, like, of, the exa- one of the execs. Yeah. In yeah. Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, Microsoft... Um, is a huge like they're a part owner and a huge sponsor for the Sounders, mm-hmm. and that's part of the reason that the Seahawks wear Xbox Green is yeah. because of the connection there. Also, so mm-hmm. I was going to say uh, that's the job I wanted Nintendo. I, if Nintendo, if the the uh, execs kind of like you know push that the GM job for this, uh, <laughs> the the uh, Mariners out to the company, it's like yeah, that's the position I want. I want my <laughs> card to say Nintendo GM of the uh, <laughs> Seattle Mariners. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for Backward Compatible Podcast number 21. Uh, go Seahawks. Um, Legion of Boom. <laughs> 12th Man, all that fun stuff. I was rooting for the Cowboys, but they're out now, unfortunately. <laughs> it was a catch. Um, <laughs> no, honestly, I'm not. Also, I will go ahead and say, just, cause I, just because I have seen my Giants beat the Pats twice now yeah. in the Super Bowl when they weren't supposed to. So, yeah. there you go. Go G-Men. <laughs> Um, so yeah thanks again for joining us everyone I'm Chris I'm Jim I'm Eric I'm Karsten and we'll see you guys next time we want you to join the discussion on our website backward-compatible.com you bring a unique perspective and dialogue makes everyone better leave a comment in our podcast section and if it's good one of the crew members will respond to it this time, let us know why you do or don't play sports video games and what you think can make them better. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.